topic nowadays due to the need for better food sources, cleaner medicine, um, and healthier uh, overall um, ecology. So we're going to um, briefly uh, describe who I am. Um, my name is Leighton Morrison. I'm a soil biologist, biologist, biologist engineer. I've engineer. Uh, been traveling the country for a number of years now, nationally educating people on living soils, uh, soil health, soil food web, uh, microbes, and how to best engineer soil systems for the plants you're growing. So uh, based on that, Peter, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction? Sure. Well, mine's going to be short and sweet. I'm Peter. I run the Future Cannabis Project. I am mostly here to stream this over to the YouTube audience. Uh, so that's my main function in this uh, conversation. Perfect. And I see it. So I, do, do you see Alex and Michael both raise their hands? If you look down at the bottom next to leave quietly, you see the hand raised and you see two. I just see leave quietly. Oh, okay. All right. Let Peter, me bring, you have uh, to make him a moderator for him to see Ah, uh, there we go. Look at this. That's a pro tip. Make moderator. Okay. You are now a moderator. Thanks to Kay's expert Now have insights. somebody else raise a hand and he'll see yeah, so late now do you see or refresh your screen? Oh, yes, I do see a little button down there. So uh, let's, for raise. example, bring Alex up. Greetings. All right, what's up, Alex? Blessings. Uh, Great, well, Kay, you were the first one up here. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, introduce yourself and let us know what's on your mind. I was just trying to be helpful, but um, okay, I'll ask you a question. Uh -huh. um, if if how do I know if I need protozoa in my soil, and I know I can get it from a straw if I mix up some straw and water, is it a wheat straw or what kind of straw is it to get that? That's a great question, Kay. Um, protozoa are really super sensitive creatures. Um, they tend to be the first ones to cyst up, which cyst means that they go into hibernation um, if the soil conditions aren't ideal. So that means either moisture or pH or nutrient imbalance. Um, so as far as making a protozoa tea, the key to it is, is you find green grass at sunrise. Um, the dew on the grass will be loaded with protozoa. So what you do is you carefully harvest the grass, just cut it off at the base, do not shake it. Um, transfer it right into a bucket of cool water, like a, bring a five gallon compound bucket, path full of water, cut the grass, put it in there, um, and then you go home, um, keep it agitated if at all possible. So that would be through aeration or stirring. Um, and then wait about 24 to 30 hours. Um, obviously you don't wanna put it in the sunlight. Um, you wanna keep it in shade or, or a cool place. Um, and if you add just a tiny bit of molasses, uh, the molasses will grow out the bacteria and the protozoa will start rapidly multiplying. Now, the key, if you're going to use a food source like molasses, is you really got to keep it agitated. or Otherwise, the molasses will settle out of the water column to the bottom of the uh, bucket and you could potentially have an anaerobic zone, which is, which is a negative impact on your protozoa growing. Um, so those are a couple of really good tricks to getting that protozoa to colonize your soil system. Um, and I hope I answered your question. That was good. Thank you. And remember, it's green grass and you want the dew to be on it. That's when you know you're going to have a good protozoa uh, colonization on that grass. Great. All right. So, uh, Kay, now how do I move you back into the crowd? <laughs> um, there should be a... But why 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 don't we why don't we keep K up as our vice moderator? Oh my gosh. Okay. K, do you feel do you feel like you can handle that enormous responsibility? I, I can until I think five o'clock for sure. No, no problem. All right. So we got Alex. Thank you, K. Hello. Um, respect Peter, respect Layton. Thanks for doing what you guys do. Um, I have a curiosity about water and applying water in a four by eight bed. I'm um, planning a little irrigation system, but Leighton, I know you have um, experience with like water meters. Just curious on what type of water meters and how many would you use to gauge the 
the moisture levels in a four by eight living soil bed and in an indoor system? Thank oh boy, that's, that's a billion dollar question right there. So let me ask you this question. What type of soil are you using? Well, that's um, another rabbit hole. I would like to use like a super simple little uh, build a soil 3.0 soil, uh, just so I can use water and a few ferments. But at the same time, I'm curious about the mudding up at the bottom in about six to eight months. Um, any? Yeah, that's, you know, that's always been an issue with the super soils is the fines. Um, so just to explain briefly about the different types of soil, um, I've done videos um, and a couple of podcasts on what's called the horizontal soil system. You can find that on uh, Future Cannabis Project, Peter's platform, or Shaping Fire podcast episode 54, or on YouTube, episode, episode, uh, Shaping Fire episode 54 extra, which is a little diagram of the um, what's called the horizontal soil system. The reason I put that together was for the cannabis industry specifically because of watering and nutritional issues. If you're going with a living soil system and you do not include silt, clay, and sand, you're very much limiting the level of biological activity and also the communities that perform the tasks of all kinds of things, both successional, successionary as well as mining those materials. Um, so that's why I recommended that method and it really helps a lot with watering. So now watering a super soil or a soilless medium, which are the same thing. The only difference is in a super soil, you are preloaded with nutrients. And generally those nutrients are what would be considered biologically active, but not plant active. So it's not like a bottled nutrient, which the plant can basically uptake. So those nutrients would be like in the form of a meal, whether it's a uh, alfalfa meal or a crab shell meal or an oyster flour. So it's gonna take bacteria to break that down and make it plant available. Um, so think of it as more like a slow release system. Um, so as far as watering is concerned, when you take your super soil out, you're gonna get a certain percentage of fines and those fines are gonna walk, work their way right down to the bottom of that um, soil profile almost upon the first watering and if not shortly thereafter. So that's where you get that mud layer down at the bottom that will go anaerobic. The other problem I have with super soils is that the top of the pot and often the sides if you do not have a vapor barrier will go hydrophobic and a lot of the cannabis community will, will testify to this. The problems of Having a hydrophobic soil, it's a nightmare because when you pour the water on the top, it runs right across the top and down the sides. The reason that's occurring is because you have a high level of bacteria. And when those bacteria are getting into a situation where they're drying out, they go into cyst form. And again, cysting is a shell or a wax coating that it's around them to prevent them from dehydrating. Um, in a system, in a situation where the ideal soil conditions aren't present. So once you start to go into that hydrophobic or lack of ability to take water in, it's going to be a very rapid effect. In other words, each community or colony of these bacteria, which are coated in, in what's called biofilm, are going to just start cysting up in a row. And before you know it, that pot's going to be out of control. So one of the ways to limit um, this from happening, especially in an indoor situation, um, is to have a cover crop of some kind. Um, the cover crop serves as a way to protect the soil surface from any kind of exhaust fan, um, the lighting source, um, which are two things that will dry out that soil pretty quickly. Um, and remember that the super soil, because it's low tension soil, the, the moisture and the water move through it very quickly. So Again, having that cover crop is gonna help create a microclimate at the soil surface. So any soil or any um, evaporation that's happening um, will get trapped on those lower little uh, cover crops um, and they will help hold that moisture in. The other benefit is they will build miles of rhizosphere. Now the rhizosphere is the coating around the root where all of the biological activity takes place, um, where nutrients are converted to plant available and released to the plant and the plant in turn releases exudates to grow out specific types of bacteria and biology to perform the task. So say the plant wanted some potassium 
well. It would release exudates specifically for phos, uh, for potassium solubilizing bacteria. Um, so they grow out that popular uh, population of bacteria. Then the plant has two ways to control it. One, it stops feeding them. They all die off and release the plant back that potassium plant available or by increasing the population so great, they encourage the predator prey factor, which means now the protozoa are gonna come out of cysts or start multiplying to consume all that food bacteria and release it back to the plant. So the plant's still very much in control. So to answer the question about how much moisture, <clears throat> there is a, there is a, a piece of equipment called an aerometer um, that measures soil tension or moisture tension in soil. Um, it's a great device, but you have to make sure you get the LT, which is the low tension, low, uh, low tension soil uh, device, not the RT. Um, but again, that sensor is going to stall at a certain level. So in other words, um, it's not going to give you 100% accurate measurements. I'm actually working with a gentleman up in Canada to develop a way to actually monitor outside the range. So that would be above 80 um, and below 10. Um, those are in a millibar or center bar uh, measurement of units. So what I generally would tell people like yourself and trying to figure out how best to water, um, I would tell you to put, uh, fill a five gallon compound bucket up with the soil, drill some holes in the bottom and keep adding water until you get to the point where everything you add is coming out. So you want, you want to first start with a gallon, get the soil completely saturated and then add a cup of water. And when that one cup comes out, now you know what your field capacity is. That's the most amount of moisture that soil can actually hold. Then back off from there. And that way you have a general idea of, of what is gonna happen if you put too much water in, um, or, or you're gonna get a general unit of measurement for how much water a, uh, by volume that material will actually hold. And every soil is different. Like, you know, Every guy that builds a soilless medium or a super soil has a different recipe. And all of those recipes are gonna have different levels of holding capacity. For instance, if you buy core from the Far East, um, they pack that core to 10 pounds per square inch for shipping, because obviously it's gonna cost them a lot to send that across the ocean. Whereas there's a company here in California that manufactures core in Mexico, and he compacts his only to 2.2 pounds per square inch. And the reason why is he does not want to crush the fibers. If he crushes the fibers, he's not only creating fines, but now he's losing water storage capacity, which was the whole idea of a super soil and a soils medium in the beginning was something that would hold the nutrients in place without letting them just wash through the soil um, and allow for fast rooting, fast, quick rooting. So I hope that answered your question. Um, I can go on and on about this. Yes, Leighton, I'm very grateful. Very grateful. That was very informative. Um, one thing I was just want to make sure I understood you correctly. If I were to use um, cover crops before I plant my cannabis and get too heavy with the irrigation, would that help me um, prevent much um, silt uh, going to the bottom, the washing out? Or is, is that what you were saying? The cover crop would help um the structure of the soil yes the cover crop will think about it like this that um in a in a soil system any soil system um you have a bacteria and and it starts to create a biofilm that biofilm is actually bonding different particles together so say the bacteria is living on a sand or next to a, a piece of clay um, and it's growing out its biofilm the biofilm will encapsulate both of those particles um, and then they will start growing out more and more, more and more children, um, which creates more and more biofilm. And that biofilm is the key to aggregation. Aggregation is the key to having a healthy soil system. Um, aggregates are positively and negatively charged, uh, both on the outside and the inside. So therefore they hold more nutrients. Um, they help to allow infiltration, which means water to come in. Um, it also encourages um, the other forms of uh, materials to act differently, like in the case of a clay platelet. Um, in a very compacted soil, you're going to have your clay plates stacked up and look at them as plates, literally. So if you stack a, a bunch of plates on top of each other, no water can get in, no roots can get in there. Um, it's very dense. Now, when clay is, is, comes in contact with biology, 
um, an interesting phenomenon happens and that place, the clay plate would start to stack up. So one's flat, one's on its side, one's flat, one's on its side. And there's an incredible amount of magic that happens inside that U-shaped um, area. Uh, again, the biofilm builds up, that helps to create that soil structure so those clay platelets don't collapse on each other. So biofilm is the key to the whole thing and, and having good aggregates, um, they're gonna be holding nutrients, they're gonna be allowing for good gas exchange, which means CO2 out of the soil and oxygen or air, atmospheric air into the soil um, because that, that, that oxygen supports the biological life and the CO2 supports the, the plant life. So it's really a beautiful dance that happens in soil when you have aggregates. So roots will automatically cause aggregation very quickly. So it is a good way to tie up those fines. So you just wanna gently dampen the soil. Um, so mist it, uh, throw some you know, seeds on there and get, that, get those cover crops established. And then when you plant your, your cannabis plant in there, you're gonna to wanna to do what's called chop and drop in a small area around the plant, because obviously you don't want the cover crops to creep up into the plant um, and cause problems that way. Is that helpful? Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, so helpful, Leighton. I'm just a greenhouse outdoor guy moving into um, inside. So I'm just, lots of changes and all of your information help. And uh, thank you, Peter, for putting this together. Thank you, Leighton, for being here. I'm excited to continue listening to all the information. Thank you. You're very welcome. And it was my pleasure. Um, were there any other questions out there? And if not, I will just start ranting about what it is. What is soil biology? Well, actually, if he wants to, uh, we got Michael Fisher uh, coming up. And then I want to hear Dan's in the audience and he's, he's in the worms. I wanted to see if he had any deep thoughts on worm farming. All right, Michael, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, guys, uh, local LA guy here been following you basically, I guess, since you started the uh, Soil Horizon conversations on this uh, future cannabis uh, platform, I guess you could say, spanning YouTube or wherever. Um, so I guess one of my questions, uh, just I have a lot, but I'll just shoot one for now, is on the hydrophobic nature, I just want to know your opinion on potentially applying yucca or whatever saponins you choose out there, if that is a good I guess, work around or if that helps or if it's, I don't know, just, I guess, your general thoughts about it. Okay, so yucca is a natural surfactant. So what that means is that um, it takes water and makes it act in a different way than traditional water surface tension would work in a uh, un if untreated area. So that being said, um, the yucca will coat the root or the, or the leaf surface or the, uh, the soil itself. Um, and the, when the water hits it, it will not bead up. It will actually move into a surface plane. So it basically coats the outside of that soil or that plant. Surfactants have been used tremendously in golf course industry um, and also high performance sports turf as a way to minimize um, water loss. So by having a surfactant in play, um, any condensation will not beat up and then continue to evaporate based on the sun. It will spread out across, across the entire uh, leaf surface and therefore providing a better use of that water. Um, so yes, in a, especially in a um, hydrophobic soil system or in a soil system that you're just starting, um, taking a little bit of yucca extract and adding it to uh, say water uh, in a spray bottle and then misting the whole thing will definitely help to um, hydrate that soil. And then once the soil's hydrated, um, it's gonna work and function a lot better for you. So yes, I'm a proponent of surfactants. I don't like the synthetic ones, but like yucca is a great example of a alternative um, organic uh, plant that you can use to perform as a surfactant. Cool. Thanks. That's it for now. <laughs> See ya. All right. Cool. Glad I could help. Um, and and uh, Kailash had a question, so I'm going to bring him up to stage. All right, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself first and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, hold on. Let 
I'm trying to invite, uh, we got two people, Taylor and Kailash. All right. Hey guys. Welcome Taylor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, question for you, Leighton. Uh, I came on here a little bit late, but I heard you talking about the LT aerometers. Um, in the horizontal system that you're um, always talking about, um, would you talk about using a uh, LT aerometer on the O horizon and a standard aerometer on the, is it the B horizon? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, in, in, if, if I was to do this, I would just get the RT and I would put it in the A horizon. So for you all that out there that don't uh, understand what we're talking about, um, I came up with a soil system. Again, I was a soil engineer. Um, I did this for a living on high-end landscapes, um, high-performance sports turf, um, and trying to help these guys get biolog biology to set up camp so that they didn't have to use any synthetic inputs or pesticides. So that being said, the horizontal soil system is basically biomimicking nature. Um, I came up with three horizons because I didn't think we needed to go much further. Uh, in the cannabis industry, it's all about the O horizon, which is called the organic horizon, and that's on the top. Generally in nature, it's very, very small. Um, generally, you know, at a grass, it might be only a quarter inch deep. Um, in a prairie, it could be very, very deep. Um, so that being said, the O horizon is where we really wanted to focus the most amount of area for the cannabis plant. But again, as I so spoke earlier about the low tension soils and the issues of going anaerobic in the middle and hydrophobic on the outside, I wanted to come up with a way to help them mitigate that. So then I came into play was the A horizon. And generally speaking, the A horizon is going to have sand, silt, clay, and organic matter, um, which I've given the recipe on those other platforms, both uh, Peter's Future Cannabis, as well as Shaping Fire podcast episode 54. Um, and that is your heart and lungs. So that A horizon is the key to the whole thing. So as the O dries out, the A wicks excess moisture out of the E horizon and, and wicks it all the way up to the top to the O horizon. So it keeps the entire soil profile at a much more balanced moisture level throughout. Um, the E horizon is just rock and sand. And the key to that whole horizon is the sand. Sand should be colored um, like gray or brown or tan or taupe. Um, and somewhat coarse, you do not want white uh, powdery sand that, that will not perform the same way. But a great little experiment for uh, people out there in the audience is to take a five gallon bucket, fill it up uh, halfway, so two and a half gallons of sand, coarse sand, and take a one gallon bottle of water and dump it in there. And you'll be amazed at how much water is actually stored in the pores, in the pore space between the grains of sand. Um, it's a really cool experiment and you'll see that the water takes a while to bubble down in there and for that for that sand to completely get saturated. But once that sand gets saturated, now the that now the water is not mobile. It's it's going to slowly wick back and forth into the A and up into the O um, between watering. And then once you water, the vast majority of that water is going to travel right through that through the O horizon down into the A and the A is going to help filter it and slow it down. Um, and most important about that E horizon, that sand layer, is that it's acting as a sand filter. Um, for, for all of you out there that don't completely understand what a sand filter is, it's a way of mitigating fines in the water column or preventing um, fines from migrating down into uh, that E horizon where there's liquid. Um, if, the, if the fines migrate down into the E horizon, they will become anaerobic over time and cause problems. And for any of you that don't understand what anaerobic means, it means void of oxygen. And basically it'll just melt the tips of the roots off. Um, because, you know, unless you're a plant that specifically grows in a riparian system and can handle that, um, a lot of the interesting work uh, I've been fortunate to be involved in Particularly, this one example is Phragmites. And Phragmites have this ability to actually pump oxygen down inside of its, inside the plant stalk and push that oxygen out into its root systems as it would an exudate. So therefore it can create an anaerobic rhizosphere around the coating of its root, protecting 
the organisms that are living there doing the work for it. So plants have done some amazing things to adapt, but the cannabis plant is not suitable and does not have the ability to do to push oxygen down into its rhizosphere. So therefore we have to protect it and the vast majority of plants that do not grow in riparian systems from losing their roots due to the anaerobic influences. Is that helpful? Yeah, you're, you're always dropping knowledge, Leighton. Um, but in short, uh, the uh, you'd be using an LT and just, or sorry, you'd be lose, using an RT and just looking at the A horizon. You wouldn't do a dual system and try to calibrate that. That'd be overkill. Um, yeah, because again, that low tension will stall. Um, and right. by stall means not give you accurate measurements. So I would just do the arometer in, in the A horizon and make sure that I got it well seated because the tip is about three inches. So you got to try to get that in the middle. You don't want it sitting down in the E and you don't want half of it popped up in the, in the O horizon or it will give you inaccurate readings. Thanks, Leighton. My pleasure. All right, we got Michael up here. Michael, you want to introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and fire away. And Peter, if you could start pushing some of these people down to keep the stage clean, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. <Me too. laughs> you have to make me a moderator to do that. Um, I All think right. Michael spoke, but maybe he has another question. Michael, you're up on stage, my friend. You might have to unmute yourself. Or he's ignoring us. Yeah, I All think right. he already spoke. He got his answer. Answered. All right, so I see that the, the little hand raid sign and there's nobody there. So therefore, there are no questions at this point in time, correct? Currently, but I, I saw, so Dan, who's all the way down lurking in the, uh, in the audience, uh, Coner, uh, Lush Farms, Worm Farm, when our organic soil builders. So I thought we could talk a little about worms if uh, Dan wanted to jump up. Up. Oh, here comes Dan. Go on. Hey, hey. Well, go ahead and introduce yourself, Dan, and uh, let's chop it up on worms. Well, I'm uh, the owner of uh, Lush Farms. It's a um, commercial worm farm organization that uh, basically raises uh, African night crawlers and um, uh, keeps them in a nice old dairy barn in a warm, comfortable environment. And uh, we harvest their castings and sell them to uh, farmers, golf courses, uh, community sponsored agriculture groups. Um, we have a few cannabis um, customers, not very many because Wisconsin isn't um, legal yet, uh, but it is, we're surrounded by it with Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois all becoming legal. So anything I can learn more about that uh, and worm castings as they relate to uh, growing cannabis um, so I can better serve those customers, I'd appreciate it. And any questions you have about worm farming, I'll be more than happy to answer. Dan, what kind of bedding do you start with? Uh, we're, we start with, uh, with bog peat. And then uh, we have our proprietary mixture of, of crushed grains. Uh, there's 11 different kinds of grains that we use for feed and then a calcium supplement as well. Um, do, you, do you start with testing the peat or do you just run with what you got? Um, right now we get it from two, we've, we've tested it, uh, um, blank, you know, they're, they're coming from two different sources, um, right now that, um, with our weather, it, it just depends on whether or not they can ship and deliver, or, you know, their winter, winter is always a challenge, but, um, but, uh, they're, they're pretty similar. So. All right. So let's talk about, um, you don't add any manures into this, into your mix and your bedding. No, there's, there's a lot of farms that do that because they, they do the, um, uh, you know, they'll pre-compost the manures and then put it, uh, and, you know, and then go through that process. But, um, uh, no, we don't use any manures because we want to know 
what goes in and what comes out. We have plenty of access to, we've got horse farmers all around us and would have unlimited access to horse manure. But, you know, I'm concerned about the guy's wearing a roundup cap, you know, when he's walking around and, you know, He's not, he's not, he's not using regenerate ag- agriculture on his alfalfa fields around us. That's for sure. Yeah. That's always a challenge for sure. And um, yeah, just for the audience, um, if you do use horse manure, you have to be careful about dewormers. Dewormers are actually a nematode. Um, and for those who don't know what a nematode is, I consider it to be the T-Rex of the soil system. So when I'm doing a microscopy work and I see a nematode in a soil sample, um, I'm very, I get very much relaxed at that point because I know if, if that soil system can support a super predator, chances are it's gonna have a nice diverse mix of all the uh, players. And so that's a kind of key indicator in soil. And also if you're you know, using quite a bit of horse manure um, that has not been aged for a long period of time out in the weather, the chances of you actually getting dewormer in there is, is pretty significant. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I have a friend of mine, Dan, that um, I went to uh, Rodale with, and we spent about a year and a half together down there. And he was a, he was a worm herder, as I like to call him. Um, his, his technique was really kind of cool. He would go to all the different organic uh, vegetable produ- producers in the area, and he would set up a ring of hay. Um, he would get some um, pretty junky commercial uh, green waste compost um, that generally was was hot. He would he would you know spread it kind of thin. Um, then he would get um, a bunch of leaves, um, you know, leaf mold, hay, straw, um, and also a little bit of forest inoculant. Now, what I mean by forest inoculant is he would go out into the woods. And he'd bring out a couple five gallon compound buckets um, filled with with compost. Um, this is really important. And he would wild craft leaf duff, um, forest duff, and he would return uh, compost in its place. You don't want to leave scars out in nature. It's going to take nature a long time to build that back up. So by bringing the compost out, um, he'd have to bring a spare bucket with him. He'd take a couple handfuls from here put a couple of handfuls of his commercial compost back into play um, and continue to gather this until he ended up with his two full buckets of, um, of forest inoculant and one empty bucket, which uh, was, was what he brought the, um, in with him to, to switch, switch out for the leaf mold. Um, and then he would add that in there and kind of blend it together um, and then fill it with worms. And what he found was that um, when the farmer threw his, his, vegetables on the pile, the, the, the vegetables would roll down and hit the bank of hay um, and therefore keeping uh, areas for the, the worms to move around the pile without ever hitting that point where you go anaerobic. And I'm sure you've probably got some stories, Dan, about what happens when, when that whole worm calf or worm bedding goes, goes south on you. It turns into a big biological slimy mess. Um, and this was his way of mitigating that and, and having, you know, the food that was hitting around the edges that was rotting, they could easily get in and out of there without, without terminate or without polluting the entire bedding system. So I thought I'd share that with, with you and, and see what you thought about it. Yeah, that's why, that's why we keep, you know, I mean, we don't do food waste or, um, you know, it, it's just too hard to control. I mean, we, we kind of got a recipe and we stick to it and we don't really have, you know, issues that we, I mean, the biggest issue that we have uh, is controlling uh, moisture content. Uh, so, you know, that's always a constant battle with uh, uh, when we're doing this indoors uh, versus a, a lot of worm farmers, you know, in the, in the southern states, you know, do windrow uh, you know, worm farming and do it outdoors. Um, you know, we, we, we have to really, you know, because we're heating the barn in the winter time and cooling in the summer and the peat comes in in the winter, you know, moving it inside. It's cold. We got to warm it because the African night crawler needs to be 72 degrees. Um, Cause they're, they're pretty fragile compared to the red wiggler, which will work in every temperature. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't mess around too much with a, uh, the recipe as far as uh, worrying about it going anaerobic on us. Um, that's great. Now, why did you choose the African night crawlers and not the red wigglers? 
uh, they're again we're being a commercial operation. They're they're much bigger worm. Uh, they're a little bit more of a ferocious eater, um, and uh, you know they're again they're more temperamental. So the, most of the home composters and we we also help home composters. We sell products called the Urban Worm Bag on our website and. And we'll sell uh, red red worms and European night crawlers to that market um, through uh, another farm that raises those worms um, because they're easier to manage. But um, you know, if you go to my Instagram page and you see the uh, African night crawler, I mean, that, some of them are twelve to fourteen inches long, so um, it's a it's a little bit bigger casting. Uh, than what comes out. So they help with soil aeration uh, and moisture content is really good in them in their castings. Uh, so um, that's that's why we picked what we picked. There's a good market for it. And we're um, happy to happy to raise the African night crawler. <laughs> Nice, and I heard that they they actually dive deeper down into the piles as well. Is that is a true fact, or is that myth? Well, I, I mean, all composting worms, you know, it's all about surface area, right? So our, all of ours live in a bin that's uh, about three feet by four feet by one foot deep. You can again, there's a little video on our Instagram page that, or on my Instagram page that kind of shows what a what a bin bin is. Um, and the night crawlers that are in there. So, um, you know, they, they'll, they'll work in that when we put them in, when we rebed them, you know, they'll work in that top foot, you know, and work that, that whole pile over. And we get about, uh, uh, 75 to 80%, um, you know, production out of that, out of that bin before we harvest. Nice. And you said you use uh, calcium as a supplement. Are you using an amino acid digested calcium? It's actually like a, a calf starter, um, you know, that you get at Fleet Farm or, you know, a, a farm and fleet store um, that gives them some grit. That's interesting. Very interesting. Now, here's the million dollar question. Have you ever done a saturated paste test on your castings? Uh, I have not. Okay, that would be really interesting because... Um, just for the audience, resetting the room, which is a conversation about learn living soils um, and how to work with biology. And we've got a worm guy up here, which is uh, always love chopping up with these guys. Um, so a saturated paste test is a way to monitor um, cation exchange capacity, CEC. And <clears throat> we're going to use a clay platelet as an example today, but please do understand that, that organic matter, so that would be uh, compost specifically, can hold both negative and positive charges. Silt will only hold negative charges. Clay will only hold positive charges. So in a saturated paste test um, around the disc of the clay platelet, we have a hundred parking spots. In an ideal soil system uh, for fertility, we're gonna have 75 of those parking spots with, with calcium. We're gonna have 17% with magnesium and we're gonna have 8% with um, potassium. And that's an ideal range. And I bet you um, that you're probably going to fall pretty much in that range, especially being that you're using such um, uh, where you're using a calcium as a resource uh, for building um, the, the calf starter or, or soil health, for lack of better words. So I'd love it if you did it. There's a low, there's a lab called Logan Labs. I think it's sixty dollars to do a uh, soil chemistry. It's uh, it's called the Advanced Plus. Um, so it would give you a whole range of all the micro and macronutrients that you have present, as well as that saturated paste test, um, because I'd be very interested to see what these night crawlers are doing, especially being that they are, they do have larger castings. Um, it would be really cool to see, see what your results are. Yeah. It, Logan, just L-O-G-A-N. Yep. Logan Labs, they're right there somewhere around you. Illinois is, uh, I think. Um, but yeah, just Google it or search it and you'll, you'll find it. I'll, I'll definitely do that. Thank you. Cool. Um, so again, my name is Leighton Morris. I'm soil biologist, soil engineer, and we're here to ask que or answer questions for you guys. Uh, Thomas, I know you're up on the stage now and um, please introduce yourself and go ahead and ask a question.
Uh, hi, Lady Morrison and Peter and everyone else. My name is Thomas. I'm a medical grower. I'm from Brazil. And uh, I was thinking to myself, I'm a scuba diver, and you've been talking about AMOs, and there's in, in natural farming, there's the, there's the fermented seawaters. And I was thinking, in shallow waters, uh, sometimes we can find like almost grasslands made of algae. And I was researching that the first decimeters of the so, uh, the sea bottom contain almost as much life as soil, and they look much as like. So I was thinking, what if we took a step further from AMOs and collected these deep uh, uh, sea bottom from shallow waters and cultivated? I don't know, and try to create a different AMO with the different species of organisms what do you think of that any prospects about that oh that's a good one my friend um yeah so i, I want you to think about seawater um as probably the perfect primordial soup in other words all of your elements are available um in suspension in the water itself i mean it's loaded with nutrients uh especially trace trace uh, elements this is why fermented seawater has such value um, and can be used in such low quantities uh, to help drive plant health. Um, so to answer your question, um, we as a species, humanity, um, has this big misconception that terrestrial creatures, terrestrial biology um, and aquatic biology are completely different. Now, there is some truth to that. There are some communities that cannot tolerate um, the say a, an aquatic that can't live in terrestrial and there's some terrestrials that can't live in aquatic environments but for the most part um, they can they they either go through one one or two things similar to an um, insect they'll have multiple stages of life for instance an endophytic fungi that's living in a leaf when that leaf falls in the fall and lands on the soil um, that endophyte comes out as a saprophyte. So now it's going to start consuming that de uh, decaying matter um, and using that as a nutrient source. Um, if that leaf hit the water and sunk down to the bottom of the stream or the river or the lake, um, now you're going to have an aquatic fungi um, that comes out of that leaf as it begins to decay. And the same is true um, when you have a situation where you have a saprophyte um, that's that's coming in contact with a um, a brand new plant you can also have the transfer from saprophyte to an endophyte so there, there's so much to to soil biology that we're just starting to uncover at this point in time that my gut feeling would be that you would get an amazing collection of amo which is, stands for aquatic microorganisms in case the audience didn't know um that could actually have a influence on your terrestrial soil system and another thing that we should take into consideration is that in a healthy soil system only 50 percent of that soil is physical in other words sand silt and clay and organic matter the other 50 percent is pore space so therefore it can infiltrate water quickly you can have great gas exchange so co2 out oxygen in um, so in that healthy soil system, you're going to have these ag aggregates that are going to store water in different ways. So you're going to have a micro, you know, micro lakes, micro rivers, micro streams, you're going to have micro rain in the form of condensation. So to think that, that an aquatic uh, organism could not live in that environment, in my mind, is very naive or foolish. So in, in the situation of how to actually collect those microorganisms, um, there's a couple different approaches. One would be to um, carefully and respectfully collect some of the root balls of the plants themselves. Um, and again, I, I, I'm a big proponent of wild crafting responsibly and respectfully. So you want to bring something back to put in place where you're harvesting this. And you will only need a very small amount. Um, seagrasses are super sensitive. And they are in many ways, uh, the, one of the most important species in that inner transitional, um, what's called the riparian zone. So the riparian zone is 
can be up to many, many feet, hundreds of feet, hundreds of yards uh, away from the edge of the water. Um, and that's regulated based on what types of plants grow there. So in the case of a swamp, a huge swamp, um, the, the, the riparian zone goes on for miles. Um, and then it, on the opposite side of it, it, it depends on how deep that, that riparian zone goes down into the water, again, based on plant and animal life. So um, the riparian zone is a very, very special transition between true aquatic and true terrestrial. And a lot of magic things happen there. Mycorrhizae live there. Um, yes, mycorrhizae can live in water and in, and in soil solution or in soil, uh, terrestrial soil systems. Um, they, it's believed that they are the first fungi to uh, begin to populate the surface of the earth and provide necessary nutrient cycling for the very first plants that, that um, began to come onto the land, the first algaes. Um, so that algae or that seagrass um, would have incredible value as far as not only hormone, uh, but also um, AMOs, aquatic microorganisms, and perhaps aquatic, well, obviously aquatic endophytic bacteria, which can then also transition back into soil. So I think that's a, a beautiful resource. Um, the other way to perhaps collect them in a less evasive way would be to just cut the plants themselves um, and take those and bring them up on, on land because you know that the plants are gonna grow back um, and then use them in a um, ferment system. And by ferment, I mean um, just water only and just soak them in the sunlight for about five to seven days, depending on the intensity of your sunlight and your temperature. And you'll begin to see a little white foam on the surface of that water. And it'll actually smell a little musky, a little funky. It will not smell horrible. So it will not go completely anaerobic. But when you get that foam and that funky smell, that is the biology growing itself out and starting to reproduce and obviously producing uh, predators. So that would be your your flagellates and your amoeba. Um, I've personally used uh, kelp that's washed up on the beach here in California uh, and done this exact process uh, and used it to jumpstart my um, compost pile. And I actually achieved some of the best compost I'd ever seen in my life um, by doing a, you know, a, a kelp extra kelp and seaweed because there was, I didn't collect just one species. I'm a proponent of diversity. So always get as much diverse as you, diversity as you can. But when I dumped it into my compost in about three to four weeks, I had what's called kissing amoebas. So every amoeba looks like it was kissing another amoeba, but what it really was doing was dividing. So every single amoeba that I looked at under the microscope was dividing. That's how healthy that, that introduction to that kelp ferment was in my compost pile. So I believe you could probably accomplish the same thing. Um, if you, if you didn't, if you couldn't find any washed up, perhaps just cut it. And then the last way you could do it is get a natural sea sponge um, that hasn't been hydrated, um, tie a string around it, tie it to a rock, um, and then and gently push it down into that environment and use the sponge, use the sponge as a surface for this biology to colonize. Um, that's probably the least evasive way um, to harvest aquatic microorganisms in a shallow uh, riparian style um, uh, uh, ocean or, or lagoon system. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, it was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, just one more, just uh, one more question. Uh, you said there there were mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal species in brackish water, so you could say there are mycorrhizal mangroves and things alike, right? Yes, uh, mycorrhizae are so powerful. They can live in brackish. They can live in salt. They can live in freshwater as well in, as terrestrial soil systems. Now, again, we've only identified one percent. Um, of, of what we know. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of species that are being discovered uh, almost on a daily basis. So the, our, our knowledge is very, very in the forefront on, on all soil biology, um, whether it's fungal kingdom, bacterial kingdom, protozoa kingdom. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got a lot to learn, but mycorrhizae happens to be, in my mind, um, the patriarch of, of all uh, fungi to plant relationships on, on the planet.
I see, I see. So if you using all that, you could consider the photosynthetic life as general uh, helps, I don't know, biology to multiply and reach um, um, other habitats and things like that. Absolutely. Um, so plant physiology, basically um, the plant leaf surface will harvest sunlight. Um, it will create an energy currency called ATP. And that is, that is also converting into enzymes, acids, uh, amino acids, peptides, nucleides, um, and all of these are also used to convert into exudates. Exudates are the carbohydrates or simple sugars that the plant uh, leaks out in its roots to feed the soil biology so that soil biology can then go out and harvest nutrients out of more nutrient dense materials like clay, silt, sand, and rock. Um, and then return it back to the plant in a plant available form. And then the plant uptakes it and grows, grows more leaves, shoots, flowers, whatever, whatever its goal is at that point in time. Um, but yes, the interaction, this, this is a million dollar question that I love to ask to people um, and often stump some of the brightest minds I've met. And that is where does the plant stop and the soil start? Let's ponder oh, that one. It's a really, it's a really great question. We could say there are symbionts, and there, the soil starts at the plant, and the plant starts at the soil. They're at the same spot. Yeah, there's an interface that's 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 incredible. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's a fun question. I love to ask people to you know meditate on and really really go down the rabbit hole of of trying to understand that the interaction is, is, is quite incredible and almost spiritual in some ways. Um, does that answer you? Does that answer your question, Thomas, or do you have another? It does. One? It does. It's really enlightening all you said. Um, thank you very much. All right. Best That's of all. luck, my friend. Best of luck. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Evan, I noticed you're up on the, on the stage now. Um, please introduce yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Hi, thank you for hosting this room. Uh, I had a question for, uh, probably you, Leighton. Have you come across any resources, books, articles about uh, archaea and agricultural soil? Yeah, they're uh, they're an amazing organism. Okay, archaea, generally speaking, live in very harsh environments. Um, they live in the bottom of the ocean with no light, tremendous pressure, living off of um, horrific, toxic. Uh, methane, sulfides um, leaking out of the Earth's crust uh, in volcanic vents. So they are um, they're a very unique organism. I worked with a gentleman a couple of years back at one of the conferences I put on. Um, he had a um, Archaea product that he was bringing to the market. And from what I could tell on the research that he had done, the white papers that had backed up this product, um, that it was very cool uh, and unique. I think the product was coming out of Australia, although at the time he was talking about trying to set up um, a facility here on the US to actually manufacture that for agriculture. Um, so yeah, there is there's definitely some uh, magic to Archaea. Um, I'm, and again, remember we only know a fraction of the number of species their function and their communities, because you know we as we as humans uh, are very reductionist as far as our science is concerned. So we're always focused on one specific bacteria or fungi, and in my mind, that is a big mistake. We need to be looking at communities. So in in anything, whether it's soil succession or biological succession, certain things have to be in play. Um, to allow the next successionary evolution to occur. Um, I recently posted on Instagram um, an article that I came across uh, discussing um, two completely different species of bacteria who had been put together in a soil system environment. And the genetic RNA and DNA were exchanged from these two different individual bacterias and created a whole new species of bacteria, um, unlike its parents. Now, this is true with the cannabis plant. The amount of breeding that's done with the cannabis plant 
and the results that come out of him are as awfully, awfully, often mind blowing, kind of similar to two parents who have three different children and each child is completely different, although they came from the same genetic makeup. So, you know, this is where in my mind, it's more about the communities than the individuals. Um, and I remember having a conversation about him uh, with him about that. It's like, well, what other what other organisms are you introducing into your um, your um, incubation stage? And he wasn't clear on that. And he was he was he was said he was going to get back to me um, with some more details on how he does it. Um, he, he was he was an in vivo or excuse me, in vitro um growing so just to just to clear the air and explain the differences between in vitro and in vivo in any biological um situation if you're growing in vitro which means in a lab in a controlled environment um, you're growing these organisms out in a perfect world there are no competition they've got all the food they want they have all the right comforts temperature ph sunlight whatever they need now, when you take that organism and you throw them out into a hostile environment, uh, kind of take the idea of a rich kid, you take them out of, the, out of their house where they've been spoon fed and, and everything's been perfect and you throw them into the ghetto and say, hey, go figure it out. Chances of them surviving are pretty slim. So in, that, in, that, in my mind, that means that anything grown in vitro is a biostimulant. In other words, it's a bacteria that's feeding another bacteria. Not that it's ever going to inoculate that environment, but the opposite is true. When you take a child out of a ghetto and you throw them into a, a resource rich environment, they're going to thrive like crazy because they know how, uh, how to manage this stuff in a, in a way because they've been so restricted. So there we have the example of the in vivo. So anytime I'm involved with using any kind of inoculant for, for my clients, um, I'm always first looking for anything that's grown in nature, in 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 outdoor environment. Um, you know, at the worst case, a greenhouse, but it's still being exposed to UVs, uh, far reds, far blues, um, some of the other things that penetrate into the soil up to three meters. So again, you know, if you're looking to inoculate or just biostimulate the existing organisms, these are the kinds of things that you should keep in mind. Um, so as far as, as archaea are concerned, if they were grown in a in vivo circumstances, um, I think that that would be ideal. Um, this guy that, that I was talking about from Australia, he did have plant reaction, but it could have been because he was a biostimulating the existing organisms by feeding his archaea to them. So uh, hopefully that answered your question on, on that specific strain of bacteria or biology. Yeah, thank you. I never thought about that. So uh, an in vitro grown biological like pile of bacteria or, or any micro, microorganism, you toss them in the soil, they just get outcompeted and get broken down for their constituents. They don't survive. Uh, in my experience, um, no, they don't. Um, so there is some products out there and I don't want to drop names. Um, but it was a product that was very popular uh, among cannabis um, cultivators for a number of years. And it was a phosphate solubilizing bacteria. I believe they had five strains of them grown in vivo. And the owner of the company uh, did attend one of my conferences back when they were live. And at the end of the conference, he came up to me and was like, wow, you just really blew my mind. I always wondered why people needed to continuously use our product. Um, because it couldn't outcompete in, in the hostile world in which we were dumping them. And he goes, that, you know, that is really amazing. And then I asked him, um, well, are you pr um, protecting yourself against genetic drift? And he was like, well, what do you mean by genetic drift? I go, well, if you're breeding the same organisms over and over and over and over again, um, at some point you're going to have a mutation or, or lack of strength or lack of ability. Well, lo and behold, in the most recent year or so, I've been hearing rumors coming around that this particular product does not work nearly as well as it used to. Um, so again, these are these are kinds of things that you really have to, you know, know what questions to ask and know your sources. It's kind of like, you know, when you go to the farmer's market, the reason you're going there is because you want to go get food that you know has been um, handled cleanly and grown responsibly. Um, you go into the supermarket, you have no idea what, what you're buying. 
So if you if you're one of those that really want to know your farmer or know your microbes or understand your soil system, these are the kinds of things that are really, really important is, is being able to ask the right questions about the inoculant um, and how it was grown um, and how best to use it. Thank you so much. I love talking microbiology and plants. So this is very helpful. Thank you. You're very welcome. And it looks like we have another hand raised here. So I'm going to, I'm going to oh, pop them up. All right, Jeffrey, please introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you're all about. Hi, my name is Jeffrey. Um, can you, can you hear me? Do I have my microphone on? Yep. You're sounding fine. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm a, uh, I've had issues in the past. I'm a, I'm a lover of soil, lover of microbiology. Um, I've been doing experiments with bacterial strains, stuff on the market, natural stuff for years. Uh, I've been growing for almost 20, uh, indoors, outdoors, uh, multiple different environments. This is like absolutely the thing that I believe in most when it comes to things is the microbes. I think it's all about microbes. So uh, I've noticed that products have definitely, I don't buy those products that are on the market for those reasons because they just, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, I think I have a question about trichoderma uh, specifically the R22 strain and what you've noticed at all about it getting along or not getting along with others, such as more uh, the traditional bacterial strains that are out there. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, you got a seatbelt? <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been doing experiments with these guys like I've been I've been inoculating with trichoderma at the beginning stages and then backing off because I've noticed it tends to dominate. And when it comes to the terpenes and flavors down the road, I inoculate with with bacterial and then different fungal strains. Uh, I've noticed that higher fungal strains at the backside gets the really good terps. I've, I've had success with the flower uh, on those levels and the extent that they can last uh, once harvested. So I'm, but this thing about the R22 strain, that's, so that's, that's my thing right now. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a deeper conversation. So, if you're referring to mycorrhizae fungi or saprobes, um, there's a big difference. Um, saprobes will not um, outcompete or compete with a um, trichoderma, but trichoderma and mycorrhizae do not pl play well in the sandbox. Uh, um, the trichodermas can colonize quicker, um, so therefore they'll grab all of the prime sites uh, to infect the roots of the plant, whatever it is, um, and they're, they're quicker to multiply and sporulate and across the board. So it's kind of like the rabbit in the hare or the rabbit in the turtle type scenario. Um, eventually the mycorrhizae uh, will begin to colonize as the trichoderma goes through a gross dieback. So what you've noticed is that trikes don't have a long life um, or lifespan whereas the mycorrhizae can theoretically live forever. Um, so that's, that's a big piece of the puzzle. And as far as you know, pushing terps, you're absolutely right. We have seen over and over again um, that a really diverse, so not just fungi, but bacteria as well, um, in, a, in a very diverse biological soil system, you will not only have much greater terp expression, but you'll have incredible minor cannabinoid, cannabinols, terpene, terpenoid pro, uh, production as well. So a cultivar grown in a synthetic versus a cultivar grown in a highly biological, diverse biological system will be night and day against each other. Um, it's just amazing how, you know, the biology is really empowering the genetics of that plant 
um, to express all of the things that it can potentially express. Um, you know, way back when, when I first started this conference circuits circuit about five years ago now, um, that was the one thing that I kept pounding home to people. Like, you know, I think you're, you, I think you want to go toward a living soil because it's less expensive and it's easier, but what you're going to get out of it is a plant that is expressing way more of everything that you're looking for in those secondary metabolites. Um, and therefore you're going to, this is a win-win. Not only is it going to take less energy, um, it's going to cost a tremendous amount less because you're not dumping your soil after every run and paying for all those bottled nutrients. And you're going to get a, a way better end product um, and a better expression of the genetics. So again, you know, trichoderma have their place in that soil system. Uh, a friend of mine uh, grows specifically with trikes and an EM consortium that he has made for him. So EM is infective microorganisms. Um, generally, it's three organisms that are combined in EM1. He has an EM12 um, that is, is very unique. And I, you know, I commend him. I've seen his work. His work is, is undeniable. Um, personally, I've had the conversation with him, like, do you think that you could get even better results with, with getting more diverse? And his concern is that he doesn't want it. He's kind of gotten to a certain place where he's super comfortable um, and can just focus on his work and not, not be concerned with trying to get a better result. And so in many ways, you know, he's limited himself to some degree, but his results are undeniable. So, you know, why break, fix the clock if it isn't broken? And I can kind of understand, you know, both mentalities. Uh, but trikes are, a, they do provide a valuable um, resource in, in microbiology. Again, if in my mind, it's all about diversity. So yes, they should be in play. Should you inoculate the heck out of them? You know, that's, that's up to you. I mean, he inoculates, I think every two weeks with fresh trikes because they do have such a short lifespan um, and he wants to keep them in play. So again, you know, taking into consideration that trichoderma are, are spores that are airborne, they're everywhere. And if you ever buy a mycorrhizae product and, the, and on the packaging, it states and they claim we have X amount of um, CFUs of trichoderma, that means that they didn't make their product really well because it's a trichoderma is a contaminant. And you definitely don't want to introduce trichoderma and mycorrhizae at the same time because your colonization rate is going to go way down because the trikes are going to grab those sites and the spore is not going to be able to. Spore only has enough life to live for perhaps 24 hours, although we don't know for sure. That is the theoretical guess from the experts. They only have about 24 hours to find that plant root and infect it. And if there's already trichoderma all over it, that, that spore is not going to be able to colonize. So, you know, again, I hope I answered your question. I went a little bit deep there on, on understanding of what trikes do and how they function in the soil system. Yes, thank you. Um, and I've noticed that if I use it in the first two, three weeks of the rooting system or the seed sprouting, and then I back off for a second and then introduce the uh, bacterial, uh, then it's, it seems like that's, that's a working, uh, formula that I've noticed. Thank you so much. It's a, this is my favorite conversation. <laughs> my pleasure. And clearly you can tell I'm quite a geek on soil biology and soil myself. Uh, it's been a passion of mine for a long time. All right. Well, um, we don't have any questions presently, so I'm going to reset the room. Um, this is called Learn or Living Soils Conversation for people who are interested in getting away from synthetic fertilizers, nutrients, and pesticides. Um, so uh, my name is Leighton Morrison. I'm a soil biologist, um, a soil, sci uh, soil engineer, and a national educator. So I travel the country, and, and actually now I'm beginning to, uh, Peter's fault, pick up clients all over the world uh, for virtual consulting. So anyway... Um, yeah, I'd like to, I guess, start from the beginning um, so people have a better understanding of what it is I'm talking about in soil biology. So we have the organism called bacteria. They are the base of the food chain. Um, they are microscopic in the essence that they are about one micron, although there are 
organisms that are quite large that are still considered bacterial or single celled organisms but we'll we're not going to get into the you know the diversity or the the the, uh, the ones that don't quite fall into the mold of single cell organism and oh, we do have a question popped up so matt uh why don't you introduce yourself and go ahead and fire away yeah how are you doing i'm matt uh grass i'm uh run high tide distribution we uh actually represent a few living soil farms here in California and uh, our whole organization is based on education and advocacy for sustainable practices. I was just curious because I, I nerd out on on the different styles of living soil, whether it's, you know, people doing their KNF or Hugo culture. Um, are there any kind of soil, you know, f food for the soil or anything that you you have found personally that's really increasing terpene content and or specific terpenes being able to like dial in on how to feed the soil to improve a specific terpene or um yeah i guess that's actually my specific question is any any kind of soil food that you've you've been able to identify to add into a living soil ecosystem that will then promote specific terpene enhancement Okay, so we're going to talk about specific terpenes first, and then we're going to talk about terpenes as a whole. So to answer your question, yes, um, if you had, say, a cherry bomb uh, cultivar, um, I would personally be um, harvesting cherry uh, prunings at the certain time of year when they prune the, the tree back to get ready for next year's um, crop. I would grind that up, so chipper shredder it. Um, the tips of those branches are all plant hormone, so they're going to have all of the nutritional value as well as its terp terpenoids and terpenes present. So by, by chipping up that cherry tree and, and making cherry mulch or cherry compost with the leaves and the sticks and the branches and the chips, you are definitely going to have a greater um, terpene production in that one specific area. Now to understand something like with 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 that same thing apply to citrus in like limonene or valencine stuff like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, you you have to be a little bit more careful when you're composting a citric because it is acid, um, where the cherry is not. The cherry is going to be more neutral. But say you had a you know an uh, orange bound cultivar that you really loved. Um, now you'd have to be using. Um, the orange peels, um, the juices, you have to be very careful because they're going to be high sugar. Um, you could use them in dilution to feed the bacteria, which you may get a increased terpene production through the back bi biological processes. That I'm not sure. But for sure, if you take the rind of the orange peel and compost that down, yes, you will increase the terpene pr um, production or, or a potency. Because think about it this way i mean it's like it, the terpenes when you break them down into a compound they're the same i don't care if it comes from a cannabis plant or an orange or any other source out there in nature it's now in its compound form so if you're trying to get that compound from an existing source into the plant and the only way to do that is through you know these biological processes so yeah, absolutely, you know, go ahead and, and do the orange peels, but just be careful because you could change your pH um, or if you use too much of it, you could go perhaps go anaerobic. Um, so it would be, it would be on a, a less is more basis in the beginning. In other words, uh, I have a term or I've heard two other people use the same thing. Don't be a moron. Don't put more on. Don't put too much. Anything in excess um, can cause imbalances and problems. Um, so you think that, that the overall abundance of like the cumulin and stuff like that in a lot of the cultivars is because people have been pumping tons of, you know, fungi and stuff versus other plant diversity? Well, that's a little bit more of a, a broad stroke of that one. Um, so again, that's why I kind of wanted to just touch on terpene production. So terpene is the plant defenses. So the plant has two well, it has multiple defenses. I'm going to hit on two of them. One is its magnetic charge. If the plant's in perfect harmony, insects won't see it. Insects, pests as we call them, are not pests. 
they're actually doing us a favor. They're giant recyclers. A pest will identify a plant and attack it based on a low vibration, kind of like, well, I don't get into the spiritual side of vibration, but bottom line, if that plant is super healthy, it's going to have a higher vibration and the insect's not going to even see it. The insect's job, its only job is to take plants out that are not suitable for advanced animals to consume them. So it's nature's way of protecting against uh, imbalances and uh, irresponsible um, passing along of genetic information. Um, so by, by killing that plant, it's turning it back into soil and recycling it. Um, it's not, again, a pest. It's only a pest because we have made our plants so unhealthy at this point in time that they are just, the insects are running wild trying to take this stuff down so that we can't consume it or, or our animals that we eat can't consume it. So pests should be looked at like that. And terpenes should be looked at as like one of their defenses. So first they have their electromagnetic vibration. And then the second one is their terpenes. Their terpenes will turn off certain pests or certain predators that could come along and eat them. So the higher level of terpenes, the more powerful that plant is in protecting itself. So think of sword and shield. Um, so in a perfect, healthy soil system, of course, the plant's going to produce more terpenes because it has more access to all the things that allow it to build its defenses. And again, that plant wants to hit its fullest potential. Ask any human on this planet, hey, would you want to hit your best potential? You know, if you had no limiting factors whatsoever, money wasn't an issue, uh, you know, you had all the time to do everything that you really wanted to do. And, and to, whether it's painting or writing or, or reading or studying, whatever. I mean, everybody wants to do that. That's nature. So, you know, the plants are no different. They want to hit their full potential. Um, they want to get to their best possible genetic expression. And so it's up to us to provide those things. So, you know, some will say, oh, it's bacteria. Some will say it's fungi. We don't know. All we do know for sure that if you have a very healthy, biologically diverse soil system, you will get plant expression that your competitors will not get, um, especially if they're growing in a salt or nutrient-based solution. So I hope that kind of helped with the question on the terpenes. Oh, it looks like Leaf's here. Leaf, hop up here and introduce yourself, my friend. Hi, I'm Leaf. And I am here now, uh, a, little, a little late today. I was doing something else or another. Um, but yeah, I I just caught the, the last minute or two of, of that explanation you were given there, Leighton. And, and uh, you know, we all want to fulfill our full potential, but, but maybe I don't because I'd have to, you know, like stop eating so much fried chicken and uh, consuming vodka and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to hard to fill out potential. There's a lot of, a lot of hangups to it, but, you know, figuring out those out for the plants are good. And when you were mentioning the fungi and bacteria and like, which one is it? I, it makes me think of, uh, at a certain point, I started to view this one because I was learning about different uh, facets of, I guess you could say the regenerative agricultural model of, you know, learn about fungi over here and there's all like the mushroom people and they're, you know, they're going to tell you about how fungi and mycelium can do everything and fix everything. But then you got like the soil microbe, the soil food web people over here. And there it's like, you know, it's all about getting, getting the microbial diversity. It's going to fix it all. And then I met people who are, you know, just, you know, full on, you know, soil chemists, you know, understand the chemical makeup of this soil perfectly. And then you can dial that in. And then you can grow amazing plants by mimicking any soil just from building it. And so when I'd hear all these different perspectives, they all kind of claim to be like, this is the thing that's going to fix it all. But I did never found them to be mutually exclusive. You know, it's kind of like you could use them all. You know, it's almost like being a, you know, almost like a polytheistic view of the world of like, well, this, you know, religious doctrine provides this type of wisdom and frames it this way. This other, you know, religious doctrine provides a different type of wisdom and frames it slightly differently, but there's this overlap and like, hey, what if they're actually not mutually exclusive and we can actually draw on all of these traditions and forms of knowledge to 
you know, get the best results because, you know, yeah, in terms of the true answers of how soil is actually being built, how plants are actually interacting with it, we've got, we got a long ways to go before we can really understand that on a granular level. So, you know, might as well try to leverage all the, all the beneficial techniques we can. And I think you are living to your full potential, as long as you're not overindulging on your fried chicken and your vodka. <laughs> All right, well, it's, it's, been, it's been a long week. Uh, you know, I'm going to get it back together soon. <laughs> All right. So uh, Leaf is a friend of mine. He's an applied mycologist. Uh, amazing guy. Incredible knowledge in the fungal world. And we and uh, our buddy Craig have been chopping it up. Um, which is one of the reasons why we started this clubhouse is because we had a weekly study group where we dove down rabbit holes on different scientific papers and aspects of microbiology and their effects on soil and plants. So anyway, this reset this real quick. This is a conversation about living soil um, and how to achieve uh, plant potential. So is there any other questions? It looks like there's a couple people up on the stage. Um, Anybody want to answer a ask a question? Okay, so we'll we'll just go up. We'll I I go. think Matt didn't get to finish his question. Did you finish, Matt? No, I I absolutely thought that you did a great job explaining the terpenes and the soil additives. I thought that was a real brilliant point. I mean, a lot of the farmers I work with pull stuff from their, their land that they currently have, and that makes a lot of sense to me too. But then finding things that are already producing high concentrations or, or lean towards those terpene profiles, that, I mean, it makes all the sense from the, from the farming world. Uh, but then you touched on vibrations and uh, not getting into that. And I'm like, well, maybe we dive down that because I've been to countless farms through throughout the state of California, you know, regulated in traditional market in the most wonderful and complex and alluring cannabis, like some of the best cannabis I've ever had in the world is always from these places where your imagination couldn't even start to comprehend like the love and intention that they put into their craft, their land and and how they work their land in harmony with 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 mother nature and so i'd love for you to kind of touch on that if that's kind of what you were leaning towards yeah sure we, we can hit that and you know just to polish one other little detail on on increased terpene terpene production um in your work as you meet these people remind them that no piece of the cannabis plant should ever go to waste the stock should be ground up in compost. The leaves should be made you know, into teas or compost or extracts or ferments. That's another way to constantly increase that terpene production for that one specific cultivar's expression. So do keep that in mind as well. All right, so the spiritual rabbit hole. Uh, I have been witness of this uh, numerous times that when you have a group of people who are happy um, they love their work. They're passionate about their work. That totally comes through in the plant, in the plant expressions, uh, in the plant health, in the plant production. Um, is there a way to correlate that? And I think there is. For any of you out there in the audience that are listening right now, you've had a bad day, right? And, and next thing you know, you got someone tailgating you or cutting you off and increasing that level of frustration. Um, that's because you're vibrating low and you're attracting other people that are vibrating low. Um, the same is true on the opposite end of that spectrum. You're having a really good day, you feel great, you're really upbeat. The next thing you know, people are just walking up to you and saying, hey, you know, how are you, man? Or, you know, they're, they're happy to see you. They're, they're feeling you're uplifting your high vibration. So um, can I, can I, uh, quantify it? Um, yeah, kind of. Can I qualify it? I can definitely qualify it, and I just did. But quantifying it, that's a little bit more difficult. Now you're going down um, trying to read um, brain waves in a happy person versus a person who is depressed. 
Um, are there clinical studies out there? Yes, absolutely. Do I have access to them or have I taken the time to actually read them? Unfortunately, no. I, I am so busy uh, just trying to keep up with all of the information coming out um, on, on the micro microbial world. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a tidal wave of information um, on a daily basis. And it's, you know, it's a great time to be alive if, if this is what you're all about. Because, you know, not only the cannabis plant, um, the cannabis plant is by far the most studied plant on the planet ever in history. Um, but that's driving others to look at other relationships and associations with other plants. So the amount of information that's coming out is, is just staggering. Um, Leaf, Craig, and I uh, recently were talking about the lowly lichen. A lichen is a plant that grows on a rock. Well, it really is an algae and a fungi that got together to mutually work together to form a plant, which is just, if you stop and think about that, like most people don't even understand that there's terrestrial algae, there is. But to have two different kingdoms come together to work in unison to create a whole new life force is amazing. And we went down the rabbit hole even deeper to the point where we found one specific cultivar of um, lichen that was a combination of three, a bacteria, a fungi, and an algae. So Although we, I wouldn't call it a cultivar. It's just a species out there. So. Well, it's a plant, right? No, and this is this is what's all right. Why, okay. A little, 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 just a little sidebar here, and this is why I think lichen are a really important type of organism to be aware of and come to gain some sort of a relationship or understanding of if we want to just understand the you know ecological context of our planet, which then ties into soil health and plant health. Which is that you a lichen is a lichen. You can't say a lichen is a plant or it is a fungus because a lichen. Like there's different types of lichens and some lichen will have like some lichen will have like a, a green algae and then there's like an ascomycete fungus that grows and then that fungus basically creates like a scaffolding around algae so it's containing it and it's creating this body called a thallus which is like the term of a for a fungal vegetative body but some species of lichen have like multiple types of fungi. And so it's, yeah, like, like Wayne was mentioning, there's some, it's like, it's an ascomycete fungus and a basidiomycete fungus, which are fungi from two different lineages and the algae. Some lichens actually have a fungus and then a green algae and then a cyanobacteria. So they actually have two different types of photosynthesizing organisms that are actually from two different kingdoms of life. Cause like the cyano, you have a bacteria, uh, plant the algae and then a fungus and they're all one organism and they, they could those all the component like the fungus and the green algae they could all like grow without the other organisms but they won't be very big they won't be very robust they have to all grow together to form this like combination organism so that's like you know in terms of getting into like frontiers of our understanding of ecology I think lichen are a really helpful device or tool because if you really try to honestly study and figure out what a lichen is, it kind of forces you to almost like have to revise or throw away like our traditional conceptions of like what's a species, what's an individual. And it's, it's, a, it's a healthy uh, thought exercise to go through when we're trying to understand nature because it's, so I don't know who said the quote, but it was like the idea that nature is under no obligation to make sense to you you know so it's like if it doesn't fit into our the way we viewed things it doesn't mean it's not how it is so yeah like it's a good one but but i so i do have a few thoughts on uh what matt's um, question about the the vibrations and you know the, the plants growing better when the people who are growing them are kind of you know vibing with them and giving them lots of love and stuff and and you know and like <laughs> yeah, and like and like Leighton was mentioning, uh, yeah, there's uh, there is research that gets into this into a certain extent, but it, I'm imagine there's not research that can take it to the level of like actually measuring the the you know brain wavelengths the the cultivator has while they're watering the plants and does that increase the yields? You know, theoretically that could be possible, 
but there's a lot of theoretical reasons why that would be happening. I mean, any living organism, like life, I mean, water is the main substance within most living things. Water has very much been observed to carry a lot of different types of frequencies and vibrations in it coming from its environment. And which is, and there's even, you know, stuff if you get into like Gerald Pollack's work in the fourth phase of water, there's, you know, actually, these, you know, these physics basis is a very strange behavior water has and its ability to transfer energetic currents from them. You know, we as animals, we're, you know, our hearts, especially, but like our hearts and our brains are always giving off electromagnetic waves into our external environment so it's we're not a box we are influencing the room we're in we're influencing the other organisms near us in some way water is a likely conduit of that because water does hold and carry information so i guess um i'm bringing those points up because it's like if we like in you know in the future when we're a more advanced high-tech sci-fi species and we have better instruments we might actually be able to measure specifically like how the people who are like meditating with love with their plants are actually increasing, you know, the chemical profiles of medicinal compounds. As well, I think, yeah, to- we're going to be able to see like when you have these chi masters that are pulling energy out of the land and, and, and charging themselves. I want to see someone create something that allows us to see that energy and see that whole thing happen yeah yes and that's yeah so there this could all could be discovered it's just you know right now we, we've got a lot of great technology but we only have so much and uh, you know who knows like, it could be discovered i'd love to pipe in on that a little bit we kind of do um aura measurements so um there are people and there are places that you can go and actually have your aura measured and and photographed to some degree and again if your if your colors are bright and vivid um, you will be on a higher vibration. And so Leaf is absolutely right, correct, about, you know, the influences of positive energy. And, and of course, yeah, the fourth phase of water is something I would encourage everybody on this platform right now to take a minute and watch on YouTube. There's a number of ones. Um, there's a short one as well as uh, some that are rather lengthy, uh, but it's a really cool uh, way to understand some of the dynamics of water that we are still just trying to figure out. And there was also a gentleman that did some work uh, in Japan where he froze, uh, he took water and froze it while exposing it to hard rock and roll, exposing it to love ballads. Um, and the crystallines that formed were radically different. Um, in the loving environment, that water grew these amazing snowflake shapes. Um, and in the harsh conditions of, you know, say the, the head banging rock and roll, um, the crystals were nowhere near as ornate or decorative and often more stunted and clumpy. So there's a couple other um, avenues to start to uh, help correlate, at least in your own mind, um, what is potentially happening when you are in a loving, happy, good headspace versus when you are in a foul, uh, ugly or depressed phase in your um, emotional state. So uh, did that answer your question, Matt? <laughs> Yeah, I'm soaking it all in. The love is all. Share the love, my friend. Share the love. So that's, that's an unanswerable question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I I try to like be. It's like, oh no, let me just give him a specific question every time. But like, I go to a lot of far off places and I get all sorts of amazing cannabis. I'm, I've tried damn near all the cannabis products in the California market. And in a lot of different cannabis from the different farms. So there's just cannabinoids and shit rolling through me. And I just, I somehow can't, can't seem to be like, Hey, how about this cookie cutter question? Hey, how about you (laughs) super smart people rack your brains around this one? So I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've, uh, I've definitely experienced, uh, yeah, different fairs I've consumed over the years where it was like, yeah, the people that grew this were like some crazy hippies who are all about positive energy and they meditated and sang songs to, you know, their their things when they were growing them. And 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 you could definitely like tell the difference. It was like, wow, this is all just positive love energy. Like there's no nothing dark at all in here. Like, wow. So Yeah, no, I mean they're running around with rose quartz water, making sure the vibrations are right in their room and following all the Demeter and biodynamics and you're just like 
Man, and I thought the last farm I was at was doing it right, and you guys just took me to a whole new plane of understanding the different realms of the universe. <laughs> It's all about spirituality, my friend, for sure. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's reset the room real quick. This is a conversation about living soils. My name is Leighton Morrison. I'm a soil biologist. My buddy Leaf here uh, is a applied mycologist, um, and we are here to talk about living soils and how best to achieve them. So if there's any questions out there, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. And otherwise, um, perhaps uh, Leaf and I'll just chop it up about. Um, our exposure or oh, Peter, you got something? Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to get Leaf's thoughts on kind of trichoderma. I don't, I don't want to say versus, but uh, mycorrhiza and, you know, in nature, they're either antagonistic or symbiotic or ca can they live in harmony in the root system of plants? Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say yes or no to that. I don't. I wouldn't say I have a deep enough knowledge, but I, I'm. I know for sure that trichoderma can be antagonistic. That's that's pretty you know well documented. But at the same time, they do perform a lot of processes in the soil from uh, nutrient cycling and and even trichoderma. You know, certain species, I'm sure some of y'all have heard of, that are used in as plant inoculums and some studies with certain species of trichoderma. I know there's been research on like tomatoes, at least, where they will improve the yields by being inoculated with them. But trichoderma is kind of ecologically a, a mycoparasite. It's a fungal parasite. It's a fungus that grows on other fungi. So, yeah, I think... It's probably a lot of it comes down to an issue of ecosystem balance. Like if it's not like if there's trichoderma in your soil and mycorrhiza in your soil, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily true that the trichoderma is going to like go and dominate all the mycorrhizae. But yeah, if you're like, you know, if you have like a pile of green moldy powdery stuff and you'd mix that directly into your soil and then you're like loading it up with trichoderma and now trichoderma is like the dominant organism in the soil then that seems like it would be a more likely situation where it would be uh inhibiting the mycorrhizal growth whereas if you had you know trichoderma happened to be a component of the compost tea you were applying and it was you know in a more ecologically balanced setting where there's going to be other things competing with it then that would probably reduce that risk, but um, I don't know, like, I haven't, you know, like read about specifically them going head to head and what parameters would make the trichoderma more, uh, um, more or less of a, of a risk because there is, you know, research, with, you know, some of the stuff that like, uh, like Dr. James White works on where, you know, they're observing stuff with like fusarium and showing that like with the right bacteria present, a fusarium fungus is actually a beneficial fungus to plants, but Without them, it's a parasite. And so it's, um, I, I suspect that with trichoderma and mycorrhizae, there's probably deeper, more complex interactions at play and a more balanced food web because there's more and more research about like how like certain species of soil yeast will increase the ability of mycorrhizae to grow on a plant root. And then the mycorrhizae are then interacting with certain bacteria in a certain way. And it's all these back and forth interactions. But if we just have like, our, our, you know, our buscular mycorrhizae spore inoculum and then like a trichoderm inoculum and we like stick them both in the same soil. And that soil didn't really have much life in it before. It was already kind of devoid of biological activity. Then that seems like more of a situation where they might be battling it out and then kind of, you know, antagonizing each other more. On another side note, trichoderm is, is also has been observed to be really potent at uh, breaking down environmental contaminants in the soil as well, or has, has the ability to do that. So it's got a lot of different functions down there. Well put, my friend, well put, that was good. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about balance and it's all about diversity. Um, they can, without that diversity, you tend to run the risk of having um, one takeover uh, or, or push out the other one uh, in competition. So. Um, that's why we preach about diversity all the time. It's the most important part to the soil. So uh, were there any questions out there or Peter, are you getting any feedback on, uh, on your end? 
I'm actually in the kitchen right now cooking dinner. So I told the YouTube chat that if the audio craps out, just someone text me. <laughs> but I'll go I'll go down. So YouTube chat, if you have questions, throw them out there right now and I'll run down and see if there are any. But uh Layton, what's your favorite smoke these days? <laughs> Oh, there's this strain, a buddy of mine back east, uh, Ben uh, grew out for me, called uh, Orange Bound, which was like, for lack of better words, like Adderall. I mean, you were so focused and, uh, you know, uplifted and motivated. Um, it didn't knock you down. It didn't, it didn't make you struggle with it. Um, and it was just a really, really enjoyable uh, flavor. Um, presently, you know, I, I'm so blessed because, you know, I work, I do quite a bit of my consulting work in, in the cannabis space. And, uh, it was, I get, I, people love to share it. And so I have like, you know, I don't know, probably 15 different cultivars right now that I'm playing with. And I'm not a heavy consumer. I just like to consume a little bit after work, you know, like tonight, probably around six thirty-seven. I'll just take a couple of pokes and you know, see how I feel. And then maybe if I like that feeling, I'll, I'll stick with that cultivar for tonight. Or if, you know, if I wasn't really thrilled with it, I'll, I'll pop something else in the grinder and, and hit on it and see what it does to me. So, uh, yeah, I don't have, I'm, I'm very open to, to trying people's work because I've found it. It's just, it's such a pleasure to have, you know, access to so many different cultivars that were grown with such love and compassion. Hope I answered that one. <laughs> yeah, cool, man. Just curious. Yeah, right on, man. Right on. So, um, what what what's Matt smoking on these days? Man, I've been smoking a ton of uh, David Drips uh, weed from Petaluma Hill Farms because I've been doing all the descriptions and tastes and effect. So, some strawberry cream, some strawberry banana, and some Petaluma punch. But I'm actually tearing into a um one of rosette's hash infused joints a uh, og fire hash with a uh, gorilla glue um i love the work that these cats uh where these ladies do and then uh turns out one of our new farms is actually supplying the remedy for for garden society so i had to go pack buy a couple packs for their joints and check out their hash joints so i'll let you know soon but uh the uh Let's see, which one was this one? The Magic Melon with the Rollins hash. Uh, absolutely fantastic. And so I'm just doing R&D here, making sure I stay up to date on the California cannabis market. Um, is, the, is the hash in those, is it powderized or is it um, liquid? Uh, I think, I don't know. I imagine just knowing Aaron and their team, they probably do... Um, just regular straight hash and then uh, then homogenize it and then load the joints. It doesn't look like anything's been painted on or anything. Cool. Peter, you do have something else you wanted to hop in on? No, I just asked uh, people on YouTube uh, if they have any questions. So I'm waiting for questions there. So anyway, carry on. Hey, Peter, what's the most unique cultivar you've smoked lately? Uh, well, <laughs> Jody stocked me up with uh, some Soul Spirit Farm stuff. So I've uh, gone through the runts and the mother's milk. And, uh, and then I have a bunch of stuff from Doc Ray, which is, is delicious. And uh, Tyler from Family Tree Seeds. And... Uh, so that's like a pretty impressive was... that's a pretty impressive lineup you got there the fun thing i like about walter at soul spirits is like one of the beds like almost 20 years living soil and and they've just been you know and then as you go up the different greenhouses it's like 15 5 2 so you have this whole like living soil like tasting zone and as he rotates different cultivars through different beds you kind of see the difference from batch to batch. It's pretty nice. Cool. Well, uh, I guess we reset again. This is a conversation about learn living soils or living soil conversations. Um, Leaf and I are uh, both, well, he's applied mycologist. I'm a soil biologist. 
and um, we we occupy the space to to help uh, people out there learn more about understanding living soils and and their and their structure as well as the potential organisms that are at play. So, um, Leaf, you wanted to share anything else? Well, yeah. actually, j j j just quickly before you go, because I got to run back upstairs. Uh, Family Farms on YouTube asks, "What's the best sand slash silt for the water table and the horizon setup?" And then I'll be quiet. Okay, so the best sand is a coarse colored sand. Uh, medium to coarse is fine. Uh, it should be tan, taupe, brown, uh, gray of some color. That that's an indicator of nutrients. Um, and the silt, of course, should be black and it should be smooth, silky smooth. Um, that would be a good indication of an extremely broken down organic substance. Um, so hopefully that helps uh, answer that question. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I'll clarify. I do do applied mycology. It's something I've done in the past. I would, I would, my, my more broad title would probably just be environmental scientist, though, because I've studied and done research in a variety of uh, fields in there. But in terms of this living soil topic, that's something I, I want to get your uh, thoughts on here, Leighton, because when you sort of talk about the soil food web, there's like kind of the standard main four types of soil microbes that get talked about, you know, like the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, the nematodes. But there's other stuff in the soil. And I, I mentioned it to get like, you know, if you want to just like mention a few things about who some of the other important players are there like it's like the you know there's other stuff we see like the rotifers and other like you know, types of microarthropods bugs yeast things like that yeah i mean it's a big topic my friend as you well know i mean um understanding that yeasts provide the successional stepping stone for saprophytes is, is a is a good a good place, um, understanding that there is terrestrial algae at play and, and that there's a lot of modal bacteria that people don't understand that actually has flagellum and in my mind should almost be called a, a, a flagellate and not a specific bacteria. The biggest problem we have is that our forefathers set down kingdoms and, and, and since you know, the 1800s, you know, we followed those kingdoms, but as we are getting more and more into our deeper understanding electron microscopes and, and, you know, understanding the function of each and every part of the cells. Um, it really has kind of thrown the kingdom system upside down in the essence that things that were, have been moved around from one kingdom to another, and that's just confusing everything even more. So um, yeah, we, the, the, the five main constituents, you know, are, are the, yes, the bacteria, uh, protozoa, which can be a ciliate in an anaerobic environment, a flagellate or amoeba in a um, aerobic environment, um, and then of course the the nematodes are the are the big players. But it goes so much further in a really healthy ecology, um, you know, to to a point where now you have, you know, both the endophytic species, um, you have like these outliers like like the algae. Um, and, and some cases even trichoderma, I mean, yeah, they're, they're considered in the fungi kingdom, but they, they do different things. Um, so, you know, Oh, they're fungi. That's fun, fungi do different things though. That's, that's an, an inherent thing about them. I think that's actually an important thing to be aware of when we talk about fungi is that yes, there's mycorrhizae, there's like the, you know, saprotrophic decomposer fungi, but there's a bunch of fungi that do all sorts of crazy things we don't quite understand and even a lot of the and, and just a little sidebar here a lot a lot of thought about like fungi and the ability of fungi to break down environmental pollutants and this whole like micro remediation concept was often attributed to the wood decomposer fungi because they're like the chemical structure of the lignin in the wood is similar to that mm -hmm. of a petroleum hydrocarbon or whatever but it turns out actually fungi from all the, all the groups of fungi can break down mm -hmm. pollutants like that. And it's not like this one specific type can do it. And we just don't really know what the mechanisms are, but yeah, there's a lot going in on in there and the yeast are fungi too, technically. But I guess what I'm really curious about is, do you know uh, what the, what information you can gather out of or what you can pick up or gather from? Like if you see rotifers in your soil sample, like does that give you any indication of you know, about the soil health or the ecological succession? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
rotifers and stalk ciliates um, are really interesting um, microorganisms. Um, they have multiple um, flagellum so that they actually run them like a street sweeper would where uh, they run a, a big circle, a big loop of, of uh, um, energy to suck in bacteria into their mouths. So um, they do wonderful things in helping to break apart compacted soils. Um, both of them uh, do uh, are modal, so they're moving around throughout the soil system. The rotifer has a big tail, which will often clamp onto something stable like a macro aggregate. Um, while he's spinning his wheel, because otherwise he'd be moving himself all over the place. Um, the stock ciliates are similar. Um, they have one tail usually. Uh, sometimes that tail breaks off and then they're really just flying all over the place. Uh, but generally you'll see them with a stock tail that holds again, anchors onto some kind of aggregate um, so that when it's doing its uh, sweeping motion, it's not propelling itself all over the place. Both of these are clear indicators of the transition from aerobic to anaerobic so somewhere in that low oxygen uh, between one part per million and and say eight parts per million eight parts per million generally is considered um, the threshold for aerobic so anything above that um, just for the sake of throwing it out there a raindrop um, i did a study years ago about understanding um, different types of water and levels of oxygen because i was in the aquaculture space and a raindrop actually has 25 parts per million oxygen and a drip irrigation tube um, at the end of the run will generally be down around five or six parts per million. Tap water is coming out of your faucet is about eight parts per million. And the ideal living uh, uh, oxygen level in a aquaculture system is somewhere between, uh, somewhere right around 10. So 11, 10 uh, parts per million is ideal. Is if it gets into much above that into the 15 range, uh, you can actually have uh, adverse consequences like burning of the eyeballs uh, and some other nasty things that, that the poor fish would have to endure. So that being said, um, those organisms are indicators of either a soil going in the right direction or the wrong direction. Um, I've seen them everywhere from high performance sports turf uh, to regular old hay fields. Um, so we know that they are, and I've seen them in water environments. As a matter of fact, fish go through a few phases. They go from a larval state to a fingerling state. In the larval state, they have to have rotifers um, as a nutrient source. Um, so they, so again, these organisms live uh, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, a lot of my early work was done on studying stream health and riparian systems health. And I would come into contact with these more often in the soil than in the water, which was sad, um, which meant that the fish that actually did spawn and lay egg, um, those eggs, unfortunately, will probably hatch. But that fry or that uh, that larval stage, um, they will probably die off because they don't have the access to um, their their food source um, in an anoxic or a hypoxic lake um, often uh, water is pumped into a holding pen where rotifers are grown out um, because they have been known to help clean up and build dissolved oxygen in the column using their their um, their motor action of, of using the flagellum so they are they're a really really important species that um, is more or less kind of disrespected and not a lot has been um, done to to understand and help bring these back into play in our environments uh, but they are clearly uh, don't do well like protozoa when they come in contact with salts or high levels of pesticides of any kind or fertilizers so they're very very sensitive in, in the environment um, i hope that answered your question leaf yeah so it's sounding like they can be a bio indicator of, of uh, clean soil in a way if, if they don't tolerate salts and pesticides and things like that but but they could be an indicator that your soil is becoming anaerobic or that it's going going from anaerobic to aerobic so you're saying like if you see their presence it might mean things could be going in a direction you don't want them to go but not necessarily but that the system's probably relatively uncontaminated if they're alive in it or are those uh are those good assumptions to make or Am I am I out of out of out of line here? 
No, you're spot on, my friend. You're absolutely spot on. Um, the fact that they're present indicates low uses of pesticides and fertilizers. Um, but you're absolutely right that it could be going either way. And often I tell people when I do microscope work, um, I'm not looking at one specific thing. Like if I see a root feeding nematode, I don't freak out. I look at the rest of the soil system. If I find a predatory nematode, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's good. Um, or do I have an active uh, aerobic biology? Do I have pre um, predators? Do I have amoebas and flagellates or do I have ciliates? If I have ciliates and root feeders, I'm like, ah, oh, this is not healthy soil. So I'm using multiple species of organisms to kind of give me, paint me a picture of what I'm looking at. The biggest problem with microscopy, if you're taking a pinprick, a, a snapshot in time about what's going on in that soil, everything is in flux all the time. You're going in and out of certain types of anaerobic conditions. You get a heavy rain, that soil is going to be anaerobic for a period of time. Um, and then it's going to go the other way and become very arid when you don't have rain for a long period of time. I mean, the soil out here in California is really interesting in that it's high clay. And when that clay gets wet, it expands. Um, but when it dries out, it clumps together and rocks. I mean, the, the, the soil crust is incredible. Um, without, you know, any biological life or, or plant life, um, that soil just, just turns into rocks. Um, and it's been a real eye-opening in understanding the, the impact of the, I don't know how many years of drought that it's been out here, um, but it's definitely taking its toll on, on the diversity of organisms present in the soil. Um, if they are, if they're biologically active soil, um, you're not going to turn it into a rock. You're going to have aggregation that supports that life, holds the moisture, but after, you know, year after year after year, you're going to cut back that biology to a point where the clay is going to collapse on itself and become literally a rock. So, um, you know, those, those are kinds of things that, you know, you, you, you need to look at when you're, when you're trying to determine this snapshot in time, am I going in the right direction or am I going in the wrong direction? So it's a matter of, of using all of these different little uh, indicators, as well as the volume of organisms that you're finding um, to determine, you know, and, and of course, plant reaction, uh, environmental reaction, you know, you, you need to look at all of these things, not just one particular um, slide of a, of a, you know, on a microscope view of, of what's going on. But um, yeah, hopefully that kind of helps people understand a little bit how kind of difficult it is in, in this world um, to understand, you know, what direction you're going in or to, you know, ad adequately and, and correctly um, help people steer them in the right direction um, and, and using um, products and not wasting them. Um, there's a tremendous amount of waste, especially in the cannabis space, because, you know, the word mycorrhizae was a, was a buzz and, and everybody and everybody jumped on that trail and started buying mycorrhizae products. Um, in my experience, and I, this is not just one out, this is multiple times I've sent in, I will not use a microbial inoculant unless I verify what's in it, how it was made, and whether it's actually, claims are actually valid. So in a mycorrhizae application, I send it off to a friend of mine who does uh, qualification for state uh, regulation uh, and in order to bring your product in, um, it has to go through his testing. So whenever I need a product, of course, the first thing I do is I pick up the phone and call him. Say, hey, Efren, I, you know, I need X amount of uh, gallons of, uh, say, a mycorrhizae uh, for this application. Who has the best product at this point in time? And I know I'm kind of cheating, but in my experience, in the past, when I've sent him product and the, and the label says it's 800 uh, units per microgram, and he comes back and says, oh, well, there's 30 in this test and 70 in that test. I mean, I've actually had one of the top products in the market, it's still available at this point in time, uh, send me a box of, of, of bags of this product. And the only spores that we could find in there were shriveled up and they were dead. They're, they're no, no way were they viable and going to come out. So I bought a bag of clay for 50 bucks. And so, you know, that, that and the fact that, that not understanding that mycorrhizae really takes 90 days from an infection site to a site where it can actually start mining nutrients and let alone understanding that mycorrhizae does not mine 
organic matter, mycorrhizae or mines, rock, clay, uh, sand. So if you do not have those things in your pot, there's nothing for that mycorrhizae to colonize on the other end and start harvesting nutrients. And the fact that it takes 90 days and your plant cycle is only 90 days or maybe 100 days. You know, what, what did you just do? You just threw money out the window. So, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the approach that, that I take in, in my consulting work is, is really explaining these nuances to people so that they're not just wildly throwing their money around. You had something to add? Yeah, uh, I was just thinking about when you were talking about like the propagules in a mycorrhizal product, because um, I heard because I was listening to Efren talk a few weeks back and he was brought this up that the word propagule for a mycorrhizal product could be three different things. A propagule could be a spore of a mycorrhizal fungus. It could be a fragment of mycelium or it could be a fragment of plant root that's already been colonized by mycorrhizae. And that those three are not equal and they're they're very different in terms of like the effect you'd get from putting them down because a spore is stable, but it's going to have to like germinate and it's going to it's like it's going to take that process and time. A loose piece of mycelium is probably going to be very uh, susceptible to just like getting eaten or, you know, or it's not going to be as likely to survive. Whereas if it's like a root a plant root fragment that already has mycorrhizae in it, that's probably will be more stable and more likely that, you know, the fungus will get the right moisture and have protection and germ and you'll be able to grow well. So if a product says it's got, you know, whatever, 10,000 propagules in it, but like it's got 9,900 mycelium fragments and barely any spores or root fragments and um, even if it is that many propagules, it may not be that effective. So that's like a whole nother layer of like something to be aware of when you read the labels about mycorrhizal products. Very well put. Yeah, it truly, it appears that the fragment would be the superior way um, because, and you, you might be able to speak on this leaf is that my understanding is that it's only about 24, maybe 48 hours of energy that that spore has to make that association once it once it comes out of the spore form uh, I've, the I've generally heard that, that it's about seven days after germination that it needs okay. to find the host yeah it okay. has about seven days if it if the spore germinates and hasn't found a plant host within about a week then it's probably going to die at that point well thank you for correcting that that's 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 really good data um, i must have misunderstood uh efren when he was uh in one of our sessions but it looks yeah, like we have a... that being said, you know, there's a bunch of different types of mycorrhizae. So I don't I don't know if, you know, species to species, it could be different. It could be like some are going to only last a few days. Some are going to last a week or more. But um, yeah. a lot left to be learned, a lot left to be learned. <laughs> and there's not a lot of money going into these kinds of simple questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're too busy trying to colonize Mars, but that's a whole nother <laughs> issue. Um, so there is a hand. Let me pull this person up, and uh, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna need there. mycorrhizae to, to terraform Mars, though. So it should <laughs> exactly. be exactly. Uh, all right. So I think I brought Jeffrey up. Jeffrey, you here? Yes, I'm here. Please introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and ask a question, and then we're gonna probably wrap it up shortly after that because we are at the six o'clock time. I'm just going to go right ahead and say, like, real quick to the thing. So I've been growing in living soil uh, almost close to 20 years. My question is, there is there potentially a species, a I don't know what you call it, uh, a microorganism between trichoderma and a bacterial, traditional sort of bacterial and traditional trichoderma? Is there, do they cross ever? and form their own species of microorganism? Well, based on the papers I've been reading lately that, and based on a conversation earlier about um, lichen, that there is very much a likelihood that, that, that these species or, or kingdoms can cross and create new organisms. And that's why I'm such a proponent of diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, I want to throw everything at the kitchen sink at it and let let it kind of figure itself out, whether it's, you know, it's just a, a blip in time, a successionary step, 
um, or, or a true evolution or, or evolutionary step. And then, so, you know, again, with, with a, a huge amount of diversity, who knows what could happen? And, and Leaf, I'd love you to chime in on that one. Yeah. It makes me think of two things. First, uh, there's uh, this thing called uh, horizontal gene transfer, which is in contrast, the vertical tr gene transfer is when something like gives birth and then the thing it gives birth to has its genetics Whereas horizontal gene transfer. We're talking, thinking about generation. That's when things basically share and swap DNA without the process of reproduction. And so bacteria do this a lot. Fungi do this. And, and there's, there's a decent amount of documented evidence that bacteria and fungi do swap DNA with each other. And there's like video footage you can look up. I think it's called like the Heifel Highway where you see fungal mycelium and then you see bacteria that are using the mycelium as basically a road to move more efficiently through the soil. And while they're doing this, they even sometimes will go into the mycelium and they'll actually, the bacteria will be like ejecting DNA to, into the fungus that it will then use. So there is all sorts of like gene swapping, you know, and sharing of genetic material that happens between the different kingdoms of life. Yeah, not just between individuals, but yeah, completely different organisms. So it is this idea that like the, you know, the collective like metagenome of a soil ecosystem is, is not probably not so confined on an individual basis. It's like, you know, the, the DNA is going back and forth. So, and so they're kind of connected and, and becoming kind of intermediate organisms in some way through that process. But I mean, you could almost think of like, you know, yeast is being a bit of an intermediate between trichoderma and like a bacterium. I don't know, like functionally, if it if you could necessarily say that, but yeah, in the sense that it's like if if you think about like the difference between like a prokaryote and a eukaryote, and prokaryotes are like the bacteria and archaea, and then eukaryotes are like everything else that's you know cells that have nuclei and things like that, and really the speculation is that the evolution of eukaryotes was more than likely at some point a really big prokaryote like swallowed another one and compartmentalized it and started having it do stuff for it and that's like probably what a nucleus is and then we also see this with things like the mitochondria in animal or, or other eukaryote cells that does the respiration really appear it has its own dna it appears like that was a bacteria that a bigger cell swallowed and then became a bigger organism. And then they speculate the same thing about the chloroplast and plants. That, that was probably some sort of like single celled algae that then got consumed in a bigger eukaryotic cell. And then that's kind of the origin of plant cells. So there is a lot of these kind of crossing over things. And, and, and like, so when we talk about the difference between the bacteria and the fungus there, where it's like the eukaryote, we're, we're literally using the working definition of like this cell has a nucleus, this one doesn't, but they might still be sharing DNA. Their functions could be similar. So yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, there's, there's some, such a diversity that we don't understand of the microbes out there that those intermediate steps are probably there in the ecology somewhere. And so maybe yeast might be something that would fill that gap, but I'm not sure that's just a idea throwing it out there. All right. Well, that was a that was a pretty good session. Um, I hope uh, everybody uh, that joined the room or flowed through the room got something to take home with it. Um, we're going to plan to do this every Thursday night. Uh, unfortunately, Craig was under the weather tonight, and so he wasn't able to join us. But uh, he's usually a regular mainstay here. Um, but we appreciate our audience, and hopefully, uh, again, you you got something out of it. So thank you for joining us. That was perfect timing because I just finished cooking dinner. <laughs> awesome. Jeffrey, was there something you wanted to add before we close the room? Just that you guys are awesome. And this is my new favorite. Uh, this is my new favorite, not paid, but whatever. Clubhouse, this new clubhouse <laughs> thing. Thank you, guys. You thank guys insert term here. <laughs> thank, yeah, you, just, thank, you, that, thank you. Thank you. Please share the word and uh, any of you out there, please follow us on Instagram and another platform so that we can uh, keep you further educated. And we really appreciate you all and, and you have a wonderful night. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Jeffrey. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, y'all have a good one. Keep the dream alive.
There you go. And Peter, I assume you're going to close the room out because you started it. That is a good question. And Kay's not here anymore. Uh, I only see leave quietly, but I'm assuming if I leave quietly, <laughs> that ends the room. So why doesn't everyone else okay. just leave quietly and I'll see what I can do about closing the room. We'll All right. You. Thanks guys. Bye. All right. See everyone. Ah, oh, yeah. End room. There we go. All right, it is dinner time in Los Angeles. Hope everyone enjoyed that. Mr. Chad Westport, did you hold down the fort here while I was gone? Yes, yeah, City, uh, I, I would assume they're gonna make the Android version soon. Uh, anyway, everyone have a good night. Hope you enjoyed that. And I'm gonna go eat some dinner. So, see ya.